Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo and welcome to Music is Everything. Each week I take a topic related to music, an idea or a belief or an opinion. I read what I've written verbatim about that, my thoughts on it, and then I discuss it more extemporaneously afterwards. If you like this podcast or any of my podcasts or shows on this site, please take a moment to subscribe. Uh, if you think someone else might like what you are watching, whether it's one of my podcasts, an idea, or a type of music that's being discussed, or one of my shows, a concert that I've played, some cover tunes, some original material from my band Rec, please also consider sharing that uh, to anybody who you think might be interested. Sharing and subscribing mean a whole lot to people who do what I do, and it would mean a lot to me. So uh, thank you, and let's get right to this week's topic. This week's topic is why top 10 lists are bullshit and why we should still have them. Everybody loves top lists. They're easy to digest. They give you immediate reasons to love, hate them, agree or disagree with them. They spark all kinds of responses. We can't help ourselves, even though we all know they're subjective and arbitrary, even though we all know they're complete bullshit. If you've been following along with my podcasts or my live concerts, you've heard me talk about my top favorite music artists. If you've really been following along, you'll also recall two weird things about my top artist lists. First, my top five includes about 15 listings. And second, it changes all the time. So if that's the case, is my list an actual best of list at all? Yes and no. Yes, because my list absolutely represents my favorites. The artists at or near the top will always be at or near the top. If you expand my list to say the top 100, there's a chance that 95% of it will never change. But also no, because those rankings are always in flux. My number one will likely always be my number one, but my numbers two through 10 are constantly shifting. The number two band might be number three or five or seven on a different day. An 11 through 20 band might pop into the top 10 next month and then pop down to number 28 the month after. And that's not just okay, it's honest. It accounts for natural human rhythms, changes in mood or context or emphasis, even shifts in opinion or judgment. We all have our unquestionable beliefs, ones that won't be shaken no matter who says what or what new experiences or information we bump into. The mistake we often make, though, is to believe that all of our beliefs are unquestionable, immutable, unshakable. If we allow ourselves to be more open to our natural rhythms, to let our vulnerability poke through, we become more aware of how often our minds and hearts shift from one small belief to its opposite, or more likely our belief shifts one way or another on the spectrum, as the idea of hard and fast opposites is often as delusional as top lists themselves. When we see that these shifts aren't just there, and that's okay, but are actually more honest and positive, we start to plug in more to the fullness of our minds and hearts and how much more dynamic and vibrant the world is. Try it. Instead of making a numbered list, make a group of favorites and a group of second favorites, etc., etc. The inclusiveness and variety of it feel amazing. You'll start to see the walls of categorization and division dissolve and possibility expand to a limitless capacity. Whether it's music or movies or people or politics, <clears throat> we should never have to limit our choices and favorites to only those at the top, the ones we're pressured to pick and stick to. We should be able to choose a group of anything or anyone and say, those are what I like, love, respect, agree with, believe in. So yes, we should make our lists. We should deliberate and decide on what matters to us. But let our top picks come with a revolving door. Let our voting be ranked instead of either or. And as with so many of the things I talk about, we'll find that we have way more connection, way more in common than we ever thought before. And yes, I did rhyme there. That last paragraph was a rhyme. There's a bunch of rhymes in there. Yeah, so 
this is the thing. Top lists have been around forever, right? Um, if you're old enough to remember David Letterman, you knew that was something that he had, but also kind of poked fun at. Um, I'm having trouble with my scroll right now, so my notes are kind of all over the place. But so, you know, we're, they're never going to go away. We're going to love them, and we're going to always be drawn to them. Um, but we should remember a bunch of different things. I mean, if you've ever read, you know, let's say an article about uh, the top 10 movies of the year, and then they give you like uh, three critics do their top 10. You automatically know and see how arbitrary it is, how each critic has their own personality, their own bent, the things that they are focusing on, etc. And so that, that goes into, uh, it influences who, what they choose as their top 10. But even when they talk about it, a lot of the better critics will talk about how, you know, I wanted this one, I thought maybe could have been here, but I put it there. They then do an alternate list, like wishing these next five could have been in their top 10. So they're already kind of breaking down the idea that a top 10 is some hard and fast thing, right? Um, and I, you know, yeah, I like it as much as anybody else, but I also understand how exclusionary it is. How it says like, these that are listed here are better than those. And even if those are a close second, like those like 11 through 15 that some of the movie critics put down, they're not in the big print in the top 10. Nobody's going to pay attention to them. They come off as being kind of second class, you know. So automatically there's an issue there, right? But uh, like I said, we like them, we make them, right? I made a bunch. I have not made them for movies, though. I got to be honest, that may be the hardest for me of all. I couldn't tell you what my favorite movie is or my second or my third. I'm not even sure I could tell you what my top 10 are, to be honest. There's just way too much variety and all of that. Um, but for other things, especially for music, since that's what I'm immersed in, I can kind of give a general sense. Um, if you've been following along, you know that my favorite band, uh, no surprise really, is the Beatles. Um, they're, I'm going to say, never going to be popped out of number one. They're going to be the number one spot till I die, right? Okay. But, um, or and my top ten... Uh, along with the Beatles, so let's say two through whatever, also includes Prince, U2, The Cure, Chicago, Matthew Sweet, The Beastie Boys, The Violent Femmes, The Who, which is only nine if you count the Beatles. And the thing is, all those bands I mentioned, they could be in any order. They, I could put, uh, there, there are weeks where Prince is my number two, you know, and, and there's no way of getting around that. And then I'll kind of dive into... The Cure, or uh, U2 will release a new album and it'll cause me to go back and listen to their catalog, or I will be reminded how amazing Chicago was for so many damn years, things like that, um, or just wish that Matthew Sweet would still be as popular now as he was back in the 90s, you know, things like that, and so that'll shift, 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 or I watch the Beastie Boys documentary, whatever you want to say. There are so many reasons why these things shift. Um, and yeah, there are some of those bands are more likely to be in my top five. Like let's say the the Who is probably almost always in Prince or almost always going to be in my top five. It, it, you know, is my pretty hard guess, and I might say the Cure. And I don't, but see, then I start saying I'm not sure, and that's why again the top ten lists are bullshit, right? Um, and that's the, you know the, the thing is not only are we drawn to them and they're great and they're fun and all that stuff and you know the problem with them being the voice of authority is that we are now conditioned by uh media and society and all of that to uh believing that if something's not on a list it's not good even again if i said if it's sort of like it could have been on the list or it's second uh, second grouping or something like that and what that does is it promotes division it promotes taking sides it's kind of the sports mentality of love hate if it's not the best it's the worst there's nothing in between or or it's meh which is almost as bad as being the worst right and and that's my whole point of all of this is let's be careful that we don't take a list uh, as as gospel, whether that means we completely agree with it, completely disagree with it, or whether that means we I have an issue with this and it gets me angry. Like, you know, I've read like the top 100 uh, songs of the 1980s or whatever, or the top 500 albums of all time, whatever, whatever it is, there are always going to be a bunch that are left off that could just as easily be on there. And there are always going to be a bunch that, in my opinion, I don't know why they were on there. I kind of get it, but they, I don't feel that strongly. It's way too arbitrary. And 
And, you know, because we are focusing on only the top, then that becomes very, it becomes very biased and it becomes very exclusionary. And, you know, to kind of tie this into something that, that, that's going on now and goes on every year and, and two years especially, uh, we're all getting ready to vote soon, right? And as we know, and um, we have, uh, by and large, in this country, a two-party system. So we, again, it's an either-or thing. It's a love-hate thing. You're either for this party and against that party or vice versa. Um, the in-betweens are things like, you know, th uh, third parties and things like that, which we, you know, unfortunately cannot really absorb well in this country because they tend, you know, like in so many cases to be spoilers. And um, while I'm happy to see as many, part, you know, candidates out there to running, it, it becomes very difficult to then kind of um, find... A person who uh, syncs with your ideology and then and then you know fully get behind them while also not trying to like shit on another candidate or in the case of music another band or something like that and and the thing is the whole two-party thing is it's probably never going to go away and the thing is we really we have more than two parties we do it's just that we never frame it that way and those two parties have such power and such like that but not only that there is something called ranked voting. That's why I use that word in my verbatim. Uh, and that happens, like all of Scotland does ranked voting and so many other countries. And the thing is, in U.S., it actually exists way more than we, we realize on a local level. So the way that works is, um, let's say there's 10 candidates for, I don't know, state uh, the representative. You don't just pick that's one that's my only one you would pick okay you would pick your let's say top three so here's the one I really want this one I kind of like to if I had to settle I would settle for number three and what and then they are weighed you know one is given a certain amount of weight two a little bit lesser three a little lesser than that and then those numbers are all added up and you know divided and they find the the total number for each one which means that let's say a lot of people pick number one, but then so many people pick number two. The total of number two is greater, number two wins. And what that does is that it allows uh, smaller voices, voices of um, you know minority groups, the, the people who are less heard in society and things like that, to have more of a say. And uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm really fond of ranked voting because it's I don't just, uh, you know, wish that that existed everywhere in politics. It I already do that with things like music and, you know, especially music and, and other things if I'm asked to rank something. Um, it's and honestly, guess what? It's much more fun and it's much more inclusive, too. And that's kind of the whole point of all this is to is to say that kind of dual idea of it is very important for us to know what is important to us what matters to us what we believe in and all of that who who we align with on certain beliefs and philosophies who we don't what music we like you know what music that really is our heart artists and things that we talked about before um that's important it's important to be able to make that kind of you know um write those names down in your head at least but let's not think of it as a list. Let's think of it more as groupings, uh, like I was saying before, because then that allows for more variety. It allows for our ability to be as you know complexly human as we actually are. And if each of us is like that, then when we interact with others, we're more like that with them. And then we, in turn, expect them to be more like that. And then the connections just grow and grow and grow. And the ability to communicate it just becomes better and better across all lines. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Think about that. And uh, while you're at it, uh, comment below. Let me know who some of your favorite um, music artists are or favorite of anything are. What do you think about any of this or what you think about the, the voting and ranked voting and all of that? Uh, because I love to hear from you because my objective as always is conversation and connection. Uh, thank you so much for listening and watching and reading and subscribing and subscribing. Please take a moment to subscribe and please, when you're done, if you can think of someone who might be interested in seeing this, please share it with them as well. Thank you and I'll see you next week.